Good morning and welcome back. Uh, there are viewers on Twitch inside those cameras at the back of the theatre as well. So if you're sitting in the theatre, you can turn around and say hi to our streaming viewers. I want to thank you all for joining this second session on day two here at Web Summit in Lisbon, uh, the AWS Developer Theatre. My name's Ian, Ian Massingham. I am in the AWS Developer Evangelism team. And we're going to have a little bit of fun this morning talking about uh, AI and machine learning. In this first session, we'll dive into uses of artificial intelligence and machine learning technology within Amazon. So how do we build products that many of you will be familiar with that have AI and machine learning features? And then after that, I will talk about what AWS is doing to make these types of capabilities more accessible for general developers and also for ML experts. So we'll dig into that a little bit. And then after this session, uh, the next couple of sessions in the agenda will drill into more spe specificity around how you can get started with specific machine learning services using the AWS platform. So come back uh, for the next two or three sessions uh, where we'll get into more detail about some of the services that I will cover at a high level in this opening session. So uh, AI and machine learning, two terms that are quite wrongly used interchangeably, OK? So they're not the same thing. We talk about AI, we're talking about uh, imbuing software systems with human-like characteristics, getting software to do things that just a few years ago we would have required human cognitive power to do. Things like natural language understanding, image processing, uh, generating lifelike speech, other things that have traditionally been the preserve of the human brain. Okay? When we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about the process of using data in combination with algorithms to build those kinds of capabilities. So we train a model that gives us the ability to convert text into speech, for example, using something like a sequence-to-sequence -sequence algorithm. Okay, so ML is the process through which we train our systems to build these human-like characteristics. And we're going to jump around those two topic areas during the course of this first session this morning. Firstly, we're going to look, as I said, at how Amazon uses machine learning to build really distinctive and unique experiences for our customers, a lot of which you will have either used directly or benefited from inadvertently. And we've been doing this for over 20 years, so we have a lot of experience within Amazon in using AI and ML capabilities to build really unique products and services. And it spans many different areas of our business. I just wanted to take a quick tour around some of those areas, first of all, and give you a flavor for how we use this kind of technology. Let me make sure my sound is off. I don't want to uh, overwhelm you with audio. And I'll just show you this. So this is the inside of an Amazon fulfillment center, one of the giant warehouses that we have distributed around the globe where Amazon retail operates, and where the items that you might purchase from where the items that you might purchase from uh, Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, Amazon.de get dispatched to you from. And what you're seeing here is an autonomous uh, robotic materials handling system, which is designed and developed by Amazon Fulfillment Operations. We actually acquired a company several years ago called Kiva Systems, which invented this technology. And we've now completely integrated it into Amazon Fulfillment Operations. And this really transforms the way in which Amazon Fulfillment Centers operate. And I'll tell you, there was a very grand vision when Kiva Systems came up with this idea. The grand vision of the founders at Kiva Systems was, imagine if pick workers, that's the people that take the products and put it in packaging so that we can dispatch them out to our customers, magically had the inventory items teleported into their hands. So rather than having to get up and walk around the 50, 100, 200, 300,000 square foot facility, they would stand in one place and the inventory items that you order would magically appear in the hand of the pick worker so they could just do this without having to move. How much more efficient might that be than walking miles and miles around a center to find inventory? And that is actually what this robotic system does. The operators stay in one location and the robots automatically bring the inventory to them. So they just put their hand out, pick the item, and by the time they've turned around, the next robot is there with the next item of inventory. Kind of easier, faster, 
more efficient and also more accurate. Okay, and that's a really important uh, way in which we put machine learning to work within our fulfillment operations processes. The robots autom operate autonomously, navigating around inside the fulfillment center in a safe way. And the inventory is also distributed in a way which is optimized for efficiency with high volume items placed in the correct location in light of their volume and lower volume items positioned around the periphery of the facility. So we're using ML algorithms to lay out that inventory and also to move the inventory with these autonomous robotic systems. We also use machine vision in the process as well. So at the end of the process, we will take a computer vision picture of whatever is in the box for dispatch and we'll use machine vision, deep learning neural network powered machine vision, to match up the inventory items. Do you have a copy of Game of Thrones Series 5 on DVD? Do you have a pair of running shoes? Do you have a skipping rope in your box? And if you don't, or if we have low confidence that you have those items, then we'll manually verify that we're sending the right things out to you. After all, who wants to receive their order more slowly, less accurately, and pay more for the privilege of getting it? Anybody? No. So these are core technologies that are incorporated into our logistics uh, capabilities. OK, uh, second thing is in uh, search and discovery. And this is one of the most well-known use cases for machine learning within Amazon Retail. This is the recommender systems capability that we have. And if you look at the Amazon Retail website, you'll see this manifest in a couple of different places. This is the second use case, which is you bought this item or you're thinking about buying this item. What is the commonality in purchasing? Other customers that have bought that item, what other items did they tend to buy? Okay, so that's one use case, and we put this uh, component onto the product detail page, which indicates other similar items that you might have an interest in. The other place where you'll see this recommended systems capability is on the first loading screen of Amazon.com, where you will see recommended for you. And in that recommended for you component, you'll see products based on your purchase history and on the purchase history of other customers that have similar buying habits to you, similar buying patterns to you. So we can infer what you might be interested in based on the behavior of other customers that have commonality in purchasing patterns with things that you've already bought. The algorithm that gets used here is an algorithm called factorization machines. And what factorization machines allow you to do is look at a very sparsely populated vector matrix. And that vector matrix in this case looks like one column with customer IDs down it and then hundreds of millions of columns with inventory items across the top. Okay? And every so often, we have a non-zero integer in one of these intersects, indicating that customer Ian Massingham bought this particular item twice, this particular item once, this particular item five times. And from that very sparsely populated matrix, we can infer what's the next most likely column for me to have put a non-zero value in, based on what we see elsewhere within this very large, sparsely populated data structure. It's obviously a very large computational task, uh, but thankfully it's an algorithm that can be optimized for highly efficient parallelization. So you can run this factorizations machine algorithm across a cluster of computing capacity, and you can get results very quickly in training re relative to the size of the data set, and you can get inference results extremely fast, which means that we can do inference in real time when you load the page within a few hundreds of milliseconds. We'll have called a service, figured out what the next most likely products are for you to buy, rendered the component, got the images to drop into the page, and that all happens fast enough for it to be seamless in usage. It won't degrade your experience in loading that home page. So high speed, high performance inference or predictions is a really important component of building a system like this as well. Has anyone ever bought anything that's been recommended to them on Amazon? A few people? What about Netflix? Has anybody ever spent hours watching the recommendations on Netflix? Yeah? OK, now there are a few more hands going up. Uh, and that's the same kind of thing. That is recommender systems using factorization machines. And Netflix have actually said that over 75% of all video views on their platform come from that recommendations box. So you're not alone if you spend many hours watching things that are recommended to you uh, in a seemingly autonomous manner. Sometimes I don't know why I do it, but I still do it. So it's a definitely an effective feature and definitely a feature that customers find highly, highly valuable. 
And then we're into uh, content discovery and content and topic modeling. This is uh, Amazon Prime Video, the Amazon Prime Video mobile app. This is the tablet iPad version by the look of it. And this is the iOS version on uh, iPhone or a smaller scale device, maybe an iPod. Uh, and what we do here is we are making it possible for customers of Prime Video to make sense of very complex and lengthy works of content. If you consider something like Game of Thrones, you've got seven se seasons. Most of the seasons have got 12 episodes. There are literally hundreds of characters that have appeared in the storyline, many of whom have been killed off brutally and in very, very unexpected ways. Uh, and if you came to the eighth season, which I think is going to be released next year, you might find it kind of hard to grasp what's going on because of the complexity of the storyline, right? So what we're trying to do here with this feature is make content like that more accessible for customers that are coming to it later in its life cycle. There's several different features here. So first of all, there's machine transcription. So convert the audio that comes with a video series like that into text. Okay? And then we can do topic modeling. This is an unsupervised machine learning technique where we can ingest a corpus of content and use algorithms to figure out what the significant terms are. Okay, so what are the 20 or 40 or 50 most significant terms in this body of text? And we can pick out those significant terms, which just happen to align very often to major characters or major locations in the storyline. And then we can construct a narrative associated with those particular topics. So we're basically extracting all of the parts of the audio track where those characters are mentioned. We could also do something similar in video with object and facial recognition and tracking. So we can also pick out all of the scenes in a work of video, multi-episodic work of video, and figure out every scene where a particular character appears. And then we can allow you to watch the story of Karl Drogo as one continuous narrative flow, seeing every scene that that character appears in and hearing every piece of dialogue where that character is mentioned. Okay, using ML techniques. The key thing is, for the topic modeling, we don't define what the top 20 topics are. The algorithm discovers that for us autonomously using uh, processing capabilities. So it's a very flexible model that can be applied to all kinds of different content without having a lot of human beings doing topic identification. Very, very interesting use case. And then uh, we have new stuff. We have uh, things that are experimental or that have just left their experimental phase and they're getting widespread adoption. This is something called Prime Air, which is a fully operational trial operating close to Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And what you will see here is fully autonomous drone-based delivery of packages. Okay, so this drone lifts off. It has an item that a customer has ordered in the trial area. The drone autonomously flies to the customer's home, deposits the item that they have ordered, lifts off again, and then it returns back to the Prime Air Fulfillment Center for recharging, ready to be used for the next delivery. And the idea here, of course, is to get packages into the hands of customers more quickly. And it's also to remove uh, traffic and emissions from the environment. So we're running electrically powered drones, which can be charged using renewables. They don't emit, and they don't emit CO2, they don't emit particulates, and they don't clog up streets uh, when they're in use. But there are a few challenges with this. Uh, we're in a rural environment here, kind of slow-paced farmland with not a lot of change. Over the course of the next 20 or 30 years, there'll be a few trees that grow, okay? Maybe there'll be a power line installed, okay? But if you consider this kind of system in an urban area, the characteristics of urban areas are very different. From week to week, we're going to have construction cranes appearing and disappearing. Uh, from month to month, we could have new towers being built or buildings being torn down and replaced by different shaped structures. We can have vehicles of various sizes, pedestrians. Uh, and we need to have the capability to navigate in that kind of environment safely with an autonomous flight system without a human being guiding the drone. So what is the link between that kind of problem space and machine learning? Well, it's computer vision. Okay? If we can see, enable the drone to see, detect, and avoid objects in the physical environment, we can operate in a way which is safe, uh, operate in a way which is very efficient, and operate in a way which ensures that customers get their deliveries. Okay? So we have computer vision models 
integrated into this drone-based te drone -based technology that allows the drones to autonomously identify things like pylons, vehicles, vi uh, structures, human beings, and to navigate around those things in autonomous flight. They're flying to a waypoint, which is a GPS-based location. But they're not navigating hazard avoidance using the GPS. They are navigating hazard avoidance using a sophisticated computer vision model, which is deployed onto the drone. There are a few constraints here, of course, power and CPU and GPU capacity. Every watt of power that we use to do computer vision inference is a watt of power that can't be used to fly. So we also need a very power efficient uh, system here, which really uh, is highly optimized for the particular use case. So we do that. And then we have this lady, uh, Alexa, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Who has interacted with an Amazon Echo or used an Amazon Echo? OK, who's got more than, say, three in their house? Five? OK. <laughs> I have these in pretty much every, home in my, every room in my house. They are amazing devices. And they're amazing devices because they do one thing really, really well, which is natural language understanding. That's more than just speech recognition, by the way. Speech recognition is, what are the tokens? I want to fly from Lisbon to London. Well, the speech recognition is, I want to fly from Lisbon to L London, just the tokens. Natural language understanding would be, the intent is to book a flight, the origin is Lisbon, and the destination is London. And then I've got enough to conduct a transaction or to make a, an intelligent decision about what question I need to ask next in order to move the dialogue forward. It's quite different from ASR. Okay? And there's actually a lot of complexity in doing that. I could quite easily say, uh, I'm in Lisbon. I need to fly to London on Thursday at 5. The meaning is the same. There's more enrichment in the utterance, but the sentence construction is completely different. But I still want a system like this to be able to figure out the intent resolve the intent and do that entity extraction to get those key pieces of data out in one hit. So I don't have to break the naturalness of the experience by re-soliciting for those pieces of data again. So a lot of sophistication in a system like this. It's also extensible. So any developer can create their own Alexa skills, as we call them, and they can extend the Alexa platform with their own capabilities. Uh, order a takeaway, check your commute. Uh, turn the lights on in your home or see video from a security camera that you might have connected outside your home. You can do all of that using a combination of the Alexa voice service, our smart home SDKs, and of course the new generation of devices that we have now that have screens integrated into them, as well as voice capabilities, the Echo Show and the Echo Spot. A phenomenally uh, popular product and persistently one of the best-selling items on Amazon.com in the US. Okay, so it's a very, very high-volume product with many, many customers available for you to provide voice-based applications for if you choose to develop for this platform. And a lot of machine learning. Sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence for automated speech recognition. Uh, various types of deep learning systems are employed for entity extraction, key phase extraction, intent resolution. Uh, and of course, the whole thing is wrapped up in a secure package with a lightweight MCU on the device, which is capable of detecting what we call the wake word to activate audio streaming from the device back to the cloud. So the device does not listen all the time. It only listens when it hears you say one of the wake words, Amazon, Alexa, Echo, or computer. There's enough deep learning power on the device to figure out when you've said one of those things to stream audio to the cloud, and it's fast enough and responsive enough for it to feel completely natural in conversation, just like you're talking to a human being. It's really uh, an amazing piece of technology. And then lastly, uh, we have this. This is Amazon Go, uh, which is a brand new retail store concept that we experimented with underneath one of our buildings in Seattle uh, before rolling out to several other locations in North America. And I think we're now active in six different sites in the US. Oh, interestingly enough, the Amazon building that the trial store was under is an Amazon tower called Doppler. And uh, Doppler was the pre-release code name for the Amazon Echo. So all of our buildings in Seattle are named after substantial projects or products or uh, let's just say corporate memes that exist within Amazon. So this was underneath our Doppler building. The experience is literally this. 
clicked, turn on your smartphone, open the Amazon Go app, you'll see a QR code. Scan that on the reader, the glass gates will open, walk inside, pick up your chicken salad, your nitro cold brew coffee, your beer, your fruit, walk out again, and 45 seconds to a minute later, you'll receive a notification saying you took a chicken salad, <laughs> a nitro cold brew coffee, a beer, and some fruit, and the cost is $12.95. We've billed your account. There's no checkout. There's no visible sensor technology inside the environment, but there is an array of sensors in the environment that enable us to track product removal and replacement. And there's also, uh, again, computer vision, machine vision capabilities that enable us to track who's where within the store, what items have they removed, match that up against their Amazon account, and of course, provide that seamless billing experience for customers as well. Uh, it's open to the public and it's live now uh, and you can use it if you're in one of the cities in the US uh, where, we're, where we're present. Okay, so lots and lots of innovation at Amazon based on machine learning technology and based on building AI features into products. A lot of you will have interacted with those products, perhaps without even realizing the role that ML plays in building them. Uh, and what we want to do at AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, which is the cloud computing unit within Amazon.com, is to enable developers all over the world to build similar products by making the core technology that is required to train, deploy, optimize, and operate machine learning capabilities really simple and really accessible for developers to use. Okay? And, uh, a year or so ago, we started launching services that were really specifically targeted for this use case. A service called Amazon SageMaker is one of the services at the core of this, which you'll hear more about if you come to a session later on today called Deep Learning Demystified, where we'll dig into SageMaker in a little bit more detail. But it was at this launch at the end of 2017 where we really started to get incredibly serious about making this a reality, about putting AI and ML capabilities into the hand of every single software developer in the world. Even before that time, Amazon Web Services was an incredibly popular place for customers to run machine learning workloads. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Data is the fuel that powers machine learning. When we talk about machine learning, as I mentioned earlier, what we're doing is combining data together with algorithms to produce models. Okay? And those models can then be used to make predictions about future data samples which are similar in structure to the samples that have been used for training. But without training data, there's nothing, okay? You need that training data in order to apply those algorithms to it and build those ML models that you'll use for inference or predictions. And where does most d new data that's getting created today actually live? Most new data that's getting created today lives inside Amazon S3, inside our simple storage service. It's a highly durable, scalable, very, very secure object store that customers can use to store and retrieve data at any scale. So if you're going to do ML, data has gravity. It takes time to move data around, particularly the very large data sets that can be used for sophisticated machine learning applications like computer vision or image recognition. You need a lot of data for training. So it really makes sense to bring your, your computing power to the data rather than take the data out to the compute. So when customers accumulate data in the cloud, they want to run their ML jobs, their machine learning algorithms, right next to that data so they don't have to move it around, suffering delays and potentially high cost in doing so. So popular place for ML. And customers of all types are already doing this stuff. Uh, one of my favorite examples here is Pinterest. Any Pinterest users in the room? I always like to ask that question because it reverses the normal gender bias in IT. It's all the ladies that put their hands up when you ask that question. There's a massive gender skew in Pinterest users. Uh, have you used the image search feature where you type in a, a word and you get back images that have that concept or item in them? Yeah? That is powered by deep learning. That is an image classification algorithm under the hood. There's nobody manually tagging the images. I hate to break the magic here, but there is a deep learning algorithm that is categorizing the images based on their content, based on their statistical similarity to training data, which is another large set of labeled images that are used to train these models. Over with C-SPAN, they are using uh, 
image recognition again, but a different type. They're cataloging broadcast video from the US, which is used to document the US political process. So the Houses of Congress and Senate, their associated committees, other legislators in the US. There's over 100,000 politicians working in the United States. If you didn't know that, it's quite a big number. And with C-SPAN, what we do is help them provide transparency so that as a constituent of one of those politicians, you can type their name into a search engine and get back all video appearances for your representative. So they're indexing and cataloging based on facial recognition of politicians in video to enable them to say, yes, my senator spoke on these 15 occasions and I can go back as a citizen and have transparency and oversight over the contributions that my elected representatives are making. Okay, that's C-SPAN. And there's many other use cases here uh, with other customers that are equally innovative as well. So let's move on and talk a little bit about services, about what AWS does in practical terms to help customers build systems like this. And the first thing to say is uh, developers are not one amorphous, homogeneous mass. Developers are actually stratified, OK? They have different needs, different use case requirements, and actually they have different capabilities and levels of competence as well, OK? So we have services that address different needs within the developer community. For expert developers that are familiar with technology like Apache MXNet, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, and others, we have high-performance, on-demand computing resources that are optimized for running these machine learning tools. Okay? Is anyone familiar with one or more of these tools? Great. OK, so you can spin up our Amazon P3 instance families. And you can benefit from up to eight NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPUs per machine. That's over 40,000 floating, floating point pipelines available for high performance floating point calculations of the type that are very common in deep learning use cases, where you want to train models at scale using large amounts of data. These are available to you on demand. You'll be charged for the first minute of usage, and then by the second, for every consecutive second of usage after that time. Okay, this means that if your algorithms parallelize well and you can run them across multiple machines, you can just get your results back much, much faster by running large clusters of compute capacity rather than one machine for a long period of time. Why not want to run 100 machines for 10 minutes or 1,000 machines? for a fraction of a minute, not the most cost-effective way. You want a minute of usage as a minimum. But as long as you're using your capacity for a minute, you can scale out as wide as you want to in order to reduce the iteration time on models that you're training. To make this simpler, we maintain something called the, who's from AWS in the room? The Deep Learning Army, AMI, or AMI, depending on how you want to pronounce it. The AWS Amazon Machine Image, for deep learning. What we do here is package up all of the common deep learning tools that developers use, and statistical learning tools, and data preparation tools, and abstraction languages for defining neural networks, and the drivers that are required to make use of the FPU hardware, and we maintain that as a gold image. So rather than having to do all these software installations to bring your machine into usage, you can simply fire up your P3 instance cluster specify the deep learning army, and you'll already have TensorFlow, you'll already have PyTorch, you'll already have the CUDA drivers, you'll already have everything you need to put those resources directly to use without having to do your own custom installation scripts or spend a lot of time installing packages. Cost effective, because you don't run your machines for any more seconds than you need to. We maintain this, okay, so when a new version of TensorFlow ships or a new version of PyTorch reaches release, we will rev the army or AMI, or Amy, depending on what you want to call it. <laughs> this is a constant point of debate, debate amongst my team. It's uh, quite funny. Uh, and then you can use the new version, OK? Or if you have a regression requirement, you can stay pinned on an older version and access those older versions of those tools so you don't break your software stack by us rolling you forward. So you have full control over which versions you use. These are for expert users that just need high performance access to computing resources with the right performance characteristics quick and easy access to these tools that they know and love, or maybe know and hate, but have to use anyway. Then uh, we go up the stack, OK? And here we're talking about platforms. This is really for, describe them as generally software developers 
that have got an interest in machine learning models but don't want to know how to deal with things like neural network construction and optimization. They just want to be presented with a model uh, which is packaged or an algorithm and then they can tune or an algorithm that they can use to process their own private data in order to do inference on future data samples which have similarity with that data. Now the way that we have done this in the past has been through a I would say disconnected tool chain. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is prepare our data. Here we're probably using tools like Jupyter Notebooks, uh, Pandas, and other data manipulation tools in Python, or maybe R as a programming language to manipulate and clean up data using the R data frame construct. Okay, again, you can run that stuff in Jupyter Notebooks, and you can do it interactively. And that's a very common tool chain. After that, we need to do small scale training to verify that our data has the right characteristics and is viable to run through an algorithm in order to generate a model. So probably train a relatively small scale with a sample data set. Once we've proved that the data is viable for training and we can get some results, then we want to train at scale. When it comes to training at scale, this is an iterative process. We have hyperparameters on the machine learning models, which are like the dials and sliders on a mixing desk that a DJ or sound engineer might use. And by moving these, we can optimize our model for different use cases or tweak a model in order to approve its effectiveness. Okay? But we're typically doing this as an iterative process. So we might cycle through several, many, or hundreds of training, training jobs right, in order to get a model which is effective for our particular use case. Once we've got a model, we then want to use it for inference. So we need to deploy it, probably put it behind an API of some type, we need to operate it, scale it, secure it, maybe have multiple copies so that we can do A-B testing. There's a lot of embedded complexity in every one of those steps, right? And uh, this takes a long time. So we created a tool chain, which is called Amazon SageMaker, which essentially wraps up all of those steps into one integrated tooling environment, OK? You get a managed Jupyter Notebook environment into which you can inject the SageMaker SDK, which is an SDK for Python. And you can also connect to data sources like uh, Amazon S3, as well as a variety of other data sources to bring data into your environment for experimentation purposes. Once you've got a data set there, you can then do small scale training directly on your notebook instances. Once you've got a viable training Program process with clean data which works with your algorithm and generates your model, you can then call the SageMaker API using that SDK that I talked about, and you can establish training at any scale on the cluster of machines that will be provisioned specifically for your training job and build by the second. Okay, we have 14 built-in algorithms for various use cases, but we also have full support for TensorFlow, for PyTorch and documentation to enable you to integrate your own algorithms packaged within Docker containers within the SageMaker training process. So you can either use one of our 14 built-ins or you can bring your own algorithm and train with custom code inside a Docker container. Once you've done that, you can iterate repeatedly for this hyperparameter optimization. We actually have a new feature down here called auto hyperparameter optimization. This is a little bit like Inception. We use machine learning to optimize the model training process. Okay, so searching the right combination of hyperparameters to generate you the most optimal model possible from your training data. Okay, so that's a new feature that operates here. And you can do parallel training, of course. You can train 100 models concurrently on 100 separate training clusters, more if you have the budget for it, and just spread your training job as wide as you want in order to find the most optimal combination of hyperparameters as quickly as possible. And then once you've done that, you get a model, and that model can be deployed with one click behind an API endpoint with authorization and authentication, the capability to do things like A-B testing, versioning, elastic auto-scaling, multi-AZ deployment for failure-tolerant operations, all the kind of characteristics that are important for integrating inference capabilities with production applications. In other words, taking them out of test and using them for services that actually serve customers and might have business impact if they're not available. So all of those industrial features are built in. And uh, that is Amazon SageMaker. Come back uh, later in the day if you want to learn a little bit more about it. Importantly, I would say, 
that we have spent a lot of time on algorithm optimization here. So the 14 built-ins that we have should be considered best in class in terms of performance and efficiency for the use cases that they satisfy. Okay, so start with those. If they don't work for you, then you can use custom configuration of package containers that we provide, or you can use your own, uh, bring your own algorithm inside a Docker container. But our uh, algorithms are highly optimized and will give excellent results in pretty much every intended use case. And we have a lot of customers using this today. Uh, across all kinds of different sectors. And you'll notice in regulated sectors as well, so healthcare and uh, financial services, as well as over in the consumer products area. Okay, lots and lots of customers using SageMaker today. Now, uh, there's quite a lot of complexity there. Uh, a lot of stuff about model training, a lot of stuff about hyperparameters, a lot of stuff about SDKs, and about data preparation. Uh, don't be shy. Who doesn't want to do any of that stuff? Yeah, OK, good. So this is for you. Uh, we also have uh, prepackaged models where we've done the model training work. OK, these are intended to provide specific uh, AI characteristics for applications like image recognition, object detection, natural language understanding, uh, speech generation, text to speech and speech to text, bidirectional conversion of content. OK. And these are really, really easy to use. You just hit one of our API endpoints, provide a data sample, say an image or a fragment of text, and you'll receive back a fixed format metadata structure describing what's in the image. Or you'll receive back an audio file containing beautifully rendered spoken speech corresponding to the text that you provided. You don't need to know anything about deep learning to use these APIs. Just call the APIs with the appropriate action and we will send you back the data, which is the product of our work in machine learning and artificial intelligence. So you can use them directly. And there's a lot of different features here. In image recognition, for example, we have object and scene detection, including an SSD or single shot detector that can pull out objects within a scene. We have facial analysis. Uh, I can see 200 faces. Uh, the first face is male. He looks around 25 years of age. He is not smiling. He looks happy all this kind of facial analysis stuff. Uh, facial comparison, facial recognition against the collection of faces that we might have, uh, celebrity recognition, and content moderation. We can essentially score content on its suggestiveness level, and that can be used for content moderation. So say you're uh, allowing customers to upload photos to a forum, uh, but your forum is intended for children. Well, you can score your content, and you can eliminate content which you feel might be inappropriate for that audience, or triage it for human review if it reaches a certain criteria threshold. Okay, so lots of features in there. Many, many customers using this. Uh, Pinterest are using this kind of technology. Uh, Artfind, this is quite an interesting startup. They are cataloging artworks. So you can say, I want a painting of a shoreline, and it will bring back scenes that have the concept of a shoreline in them. These aren't photos, by the way. These are often expressionist pieces of art or abstract pieces of art which have statistical similarity with photos of shorelines. So there's some really interesting kind of cross-domain products and services that you can build by using these kinds of, kinds of approaches. And we also have the same kind of thing for video as well with uh, person tracking and activity detection here. So with a still photo, you can't really tell when someone's you know, jumping. But with a video stream, the time dimension is a factor. And we can analyze successive frames within the stream and figure out what people are doing, what activities are they performing in that video. This can provide indexing and metadata search across video content. And then, uh, just as an example on speech generation, we have this service called Amazon Polly. Uh, this will generate lifelike speech in uh, 25 different languages with over 50 different voices. So we can uh, render male and female voices. We can, in many languages, render children, boys and girls. Uh, we have several different adult voices in some of the more commonly used languages, like English, for example. And we can also exercise fine-grained control over the expressive nature of the voice. We can, we can whisper, or we can tell the machine to talk extra loud and really aggressively. We have creative control. So we can use this service not only for functional voice interfaces, like uh, 
creating products that are accessible, for example, to people that might have visual impairments, but also for creative works like audiobooks or to voice training videos or to create uh, creative content for children or adults within content platforms. We can do all of that stuff autonomously without having to employ uh, voice acting talent. We can also do it on demand. So there's a really interesting use case with this in the UK with RNIB. This is a non-profit focused on improving the lives of individuals that have serious visual impairments that are blind or partially sighted. And they do on-demand content transcription. So I want to read a magazine or read a newspaper, but I have such poor eyesight that I can't do so. They can create an on-demand audio transcript. When I request the item, a few seconds later, I can start listening to it. But they do that on an on-demand basis, so it enables them to address a much wider catalogue of content and also to address content that has a very short shelf life, like news content, for example. You wouldn't typically get a voice actor to transcribe that to audio because it's gone in a day or a week or a couple of weeks. It's no longer valuable. It's not a novel or a textbook which has a shelf life of several years. Uh, the content it diminishes in value very quickly. But with on-demand transcription, audio transcription on demand, you can make that kind of content accessible just to the handful of people that want to listen to it. And you can do so on a very cost-effective basis as well. So it's a really powerful tool for accessibility use cases. Uh, the Amazon Echo team just announced, the Alexa team just announced a couple of weeks ago, that you can also use all of these voices within Alexa skills now. So your Alexa skills can use custom machine rendered voices for creative purposes or to give your particular skill a custom voice which sets it apart from other skills that might be built out on the Echo and Alexa platform. So you can also integrate Polly with, uh, with Alexa skills now. Okay, great. So just to wrap up, we've got a very broad platform for machine learning. We haven't talked here about uh, services like EMR or services like Amazon Redshift and Redshift Spectrum, but we have other services for managing data, structured or unstructured data, at really high scale and with really good durability characteristics. So the first part of the pipeline, which is preparing and shaping your data, you can actually do that from structured sources using these tools. You can also run full-blown machine learning work workflows directly on EMR using Spark ML, which is another open source tool for machine learning development. Then we have a security framework which wraps, wraps around everything, so you can do all of this in a way which protects those data assets. It's very probable that you'll want to do machine learning on proprietary high-value data. And with AWS, you can protect that data in the way that it needs to be protected. And you can also demonstrate to regulators and stakeholders that you are protecting it in the way that it needs to be protected, which is fundamental to many use cases. Then we have uh, these powerful GPU and CPU instances for training and for inference. And at the core of it all, we have storage with this S3 service, which enables you to aggregate large amounts of training data in a way which is highly durable, highly secure, and infinitely scalable, because you can deposit data at whatever scale you wish in the platform using that service. OK, so uh, when you scan in here, we will send you follow-up slides from all of the sessions in the theatre this week, so keep an eye out on your email for that. If you're outside the theatre, hi, people outside the theatre. Uh, if you allow us to scan your badge, we'll not only send you the slides, but we'll also give you $200 in AWS credits to use on any of our services. So visit our team by the desks here, get a quick badge scan, and we'll reward you uh, with $200 of credit for doing so. And I will just say thank you very much.